morning, South Fork. Good morning. We are so glad to see you here today, all your bright and shining faces on this glorious day outside. So we are here to praise and honor our God, our Father, the triune God. So would you stand with us as we begin our song service? We waited for this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our prayer. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. the 
God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand Thank you. You may be seated. As we move toward a time of communion, so often we're called to reflect. But this morning, after singing those songs, I don't know how we can do anything but celebrate the goodness, the greatness, the powerfulness of our God. And he is one who can turn graves into gardens. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's no 
The prophet Isaiah was writing at a time when, when the people of God uh, were forgetting about God, uh, when the people of God were forgetting that it was God who uh, rescued them at the Red Sea. The people of God uh, forgot. Uh, all that God had done uh, in reaching out to them. Not only that, but the prophet Isaiah was writing at a time when those who were not the people of God were more than, more than skeptical. Uh, they were living in, in opposition, in animosity uh, to, to the message of God. And it was at that time that Isaiah wrote these words, uh, chapter 64, verse 1. Because it is his expression of his plea to God, his prayer to God. Oh, that you would rend, rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As I read Isaiah's prayer, another event came to mind more recently, but yet somewhat seemingly ancient to us. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Matthew wrote these words upon the death of Jesus. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Praise God that we serve, that we worship a God who answers prayer. Isaiah's prayer, the prayer of the prayers of those who've been seeking God throughout history and our prayers. And that's what we come to celebrate today is at communion time, we celebrate God answering Isaiah's prayer. God, come down. Rend the, 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 the barrier between heaven and earth, between you and us. Do it in such a way that the mountains shake. And so it, it was, and we celebrate that. We rejoice that we serve a God who answers prayer. Uh, that we serve a God who, who left heaven 
to turn the earth upside down. We serve a God who forgives and a God who saves. Together, would we celebrate by together eating bread that represents Jesus' body? And would we celebrate a new covenant brought in such an incredible fashion, an earth-shattering fashion, a, a curtain-rendering fashion, a new covenant in his blood? Our most gracious God, willing to, willing to send your Son, to be God with us, God for us, to come and to suffer in our stead, to pay the price for our sin, to make it possible for us to be with you, to be fully yours, your children, your forever family. Father, we thank you with our whole heart and being. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's nothing worth more that can ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the air your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord let us become 
more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. If you've been here for the last 16 weeks, you know that we have been walking our way through the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. And if you're here today uh, for the first time, we welcome you and uh, hope that you can benefit even from this last uh, session that we're going to spend with looking at this great, great New Testament book. You know, in this book, we've seen a very strong connection between Paul and and those who became followers of Christ at Corinth, to the point that Paul refers to himself as their spiritual father, and, he, and they are his spiritual children. And as their spiritual father, he explains over and over again how he went to such great lengths not to become a financial burden to them in any way. And what, we see, what we've seen throughout the book is how he just consistently shares his love for these people, even though sometimes he points out that he doesn't feel like they feel the same way towards him. The reason that he says that's the case is because there was this group of teachers who had come into town after he left, who had been teaching things that were contrary to what he was teaching and doing their best to discredit both himself and his ministry. And there seems to be a few people who may have listened to those accusations. The primary thing that he was being attacked for was that he wasn't a real apostle. He wasn't authoritative as the apostle of Jesus Christ that he really was. They would say that he wasn't eloquent. His style of ministry and the very fact that he wouldn't let them pay him would just show that he wasn't real. He wasn't a real apostle. You know, it was during Paul's interactions with the church that he had made it very clear that they needed to stop practicing and, and even embracing some of this sinful behavior that was going on in their own lives and in the church. His message was basically this, if you really receive the gospel of Jesus, then you wouldn't keep doing those things. You would have stopped and accepted the grace of God. And you wouldn't be participating in sexual immorality that was so common in the community and allowing there to be divisions inside the church. Paul had spent a year and a half with these people, longer than any other church that he started. And then he wrote a letter called 1 Corinthians. He heard back from them. He had more questions. He visited them a second time. And then he wrote this book that we know as 2 Corinthians. And what we have in 2 Corinthians is a spiritual father pleading, really, pleading with his wayward spiritual children to stop sinning and to do what they know that they should do, which is to live a godly life. But those of us who have been children, which I think is all of us, okay, and those of us who have had children, know that parents can talk until they're blue in the face about what should be done. But oftentimes real change only happens when there's accountability. 
Now, there's a word that we either love or hate, isn't it? Accountability. We love accountability when someone else is being held accountable for their actions, don't we? <laughs> but when we're being held accountable for our behavior, that's not as much fun. I, I like what the Christian artist and, and songwriter Steve Green said a few years ago. When he said this, he says, accountability to me is just unnatural. He says, my tendency is to only let you know enough about me to give you a good impression. He says, I'm a recovering hypocrite. <laughs> kind of hits the nail on the head, doesn't he? Why is it so many people start New Year's by making resolu resolutions <laughs> and making goals and then just kind of walking away from them just a few weeks into the year? Part of the reason may be because they were never really committed to whatever they wanted to do, but probably even more important than that was that they never had anyone hold them accountable for what they wanted to do and to make sure that they were on the right track. You know, we can see the positive results in groups and organizations where accountability is non-negotiable. Take, for instance, the U.S. Marine Corps. According to retired Major David Dixon of the United States Marine Corps, from day one, every Marine is taught to live a life worthy of being a Marine. And they're taught that they are also to hold one another accountable to that standard of excellence. He says this, if a Marine next to you is falling asleep in class, you must have the moral courage to wake him up and to motivate him to stay awake. If you are caught sleeping in class at boot camp, not only do you get in trouble for laziness, but the Marine to your left and to your right get in trouble for the lack of moral courage because they should have corrected you when you were in the wrong. <laughs> if you were a Marine or you know a Marine, you know that discipline is so important. And with that discipline comes accountability for what they do. What do you think would happen in churches if people took the same responsibility for their neighbor who fell asleep? Not that that happens here. Truth is, there are some churches who have tried to incorporate high levels of accountability through requirements and, and legalism and things like that, but... You know, what typically happens is people will respond favorably for a while, but they'll figure out, you know what, I can't live up to perfection. I can't be perfect. So therefore, after a while, they'll even stop trying. And the reason for that is because external structures cannot bring about spiritual obedience. Any more than walls can protect gardens. I, I, I like the story that Amy Simpson told a few years back she says once a man planted a garden and was delighted when the shoots started to emerge on the plants every day he went and weeded at his garden until it grew and was ecstatic to see it begin to produce produce to, to make produce however a few days later he went to his garden and was dismayed every plant showed evidence of hungry rodents and rabbits rabbits that had raided his crop so he decided to erect a fence a few days later, the man again went to his garden and saw the same thing. So he put up another fence and another fence and yet another fence. Every time he checked, he found vermin had raided the garden. And finally, he realized that critters could go over, through, or under just about any fence. So what he did is he erected a brick wall with a very deep concrete foundation. Weeks later, he climbed over that wall and was horrified to find that it was choked with weeds. And the garden was cracked and the plants wilted. And worst of all, the entire crop was gone. Because he had been trust trusting in the wall's protection. And had forgotten to tend the garden. You know, tending our spiritual gardens <laughs> means that we're going to allow others to hold us accountable for spiritual growth. And I think what we're going to see as we wrap up 2 Corinthians today is we're going to see Paul's plan, his plea, and his prayer as he tends the spiritual garden that he had planted in this church in Corinth. Let's look first at the plan that he had. If you were with us early, you know that back in chapter 1, 
Paul had been criticized because he had said he was going to Corinth and then he didn't go. And this was his response back in chapter 1 when he said in verse 23, again, today's New Living Translation Day. He says, now I call upon God as my witness that I am telling the truth. The reason I did not return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. But that does not mean that we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so that you will be full of joy, for it is by your own faith that you stand firm. I guess Paul's plan was that he didn't want to put up all these legalistic requirements that he thought people would obey, because he knew that spiritual growth doesn't happen that way. It takes that personal touch. It takes that accountability. So when he ends this letter, okay, in chapter 13, he references back to another visit. Look at this in chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to visit you. And as scripture says, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I've already warned those who have, not, who have, who have been sinning when I was there on my second visit. Now I again warn them and all others, just as I did before. The next time, I will not spare them. The time had come for him to go back for his third visit and to hold them accountable for what he had told them to deal with. Had they dealt with those issues that he told them they needed to deal with? His point was this. I've been very gracious. I've put this visit off as long as I possibly can so that you can get things in order. And when I come, I'm not going to be this weak, you know, little vessel like I've been accused of being in the past. I'm going to have all of the strength of the resurrected Christ with me when I come. And you see that in verses 3 and 4. When you're growing up, did you ever do something and your mom said, just wait till your dad gets home? <laughs> ever have that happen? Usually that's because they didn't want to be the disciplinarian. <laughs> they wanted to be the, the dad, to be the bad guy, and to hold you accountable. By the grace of God, I don't think my mom said that to me very much, but um, she just took care of it herself. Um, you know, in Paul's case, what he's saying is, uh, you know what, guys? When I come, it's going to be me that's going to hold you accountable. But before he came... Let's look at the plea that he gave to them, okay? I, I think what we see in this plea is Paul saying, without him really saying, is I really don't want to be the bad guy here. So would you do whatever you need to do before I get there? I'll give you one last piece of wisdom, he says. And let's look at that in verses 5 and 6. He says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely, surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you, and if not, you failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic ministry or authority. What was Paul's plea to them? Test yourselves. And there was one question on the test. And the question was this, do you see Jesus Christ living in you? That's it. I don't know about you, but whenever I have been asked to take a test, I always feel more comfortable when I've studied and I'm pretty confident I know the answers going into the test. Is that correct? Do you feel the same way? Have, you know, but it's those other times when I haven't put forth all of the effort and done all of the work ahead of time that when that teacher lays that test down before me, fear and trepidation kicks in. Now, by the grace of God, there haven't been a lot of tests that I failed in my life, but there was one, okay, that was probably one of the most important tests. It was when I was working as a healthcare administrator. I was being moved from Southern Illinois uh, to Indiana and I had taken the test in Illinois to become a licensed health facility administrator, okay? And in Illinois, that test alone is a grueling eight-hour experience in one day. You're expected to know about two notebooks full of regulations and, and codes for both state and federal regulations. And I studied my tail off for that test. I really did. I even went to seminars to tell me how to study for it and even to help me study for it. 
And they said at those seminars, they said, you know, less than about, oh, 30% of the people pass the test the first time that they take it. So the anticipation is that you will take it again. I studied more. I passed the test by the grace of God. It was amazing. And then when I was moved from Illinois to Indiana, I heard that the Indiana test, I didn't have to take the federal part anymore. And the Indiana regulations were about 100 pages. So guess what? I didn't study very much. And guess what? I failed. I remember the day I had to call my boss and tell him, I had to be accountable, that uh, I failed the test. Because what that meant was that I couldn't be the administrator of that nursing home. They had to have someone else who was licensed in the state of Indiana come in and use their license while I studied for the next test, which was like three months later. Can I say this? Out of the 200 questions on the test, I'm pretty sure I missed one or two, and that was it. Because I studied. I examined myself. I knew that material before I walked into that room, and I was out of there in no time at all. You know, Paul wanted the Corinthians to be prepared for when he was coming to see them and hold them accountable. So he pleaded with them to examine their lives to see if Christ's teachings, if the leading of the Holy Spirit was evident in their lives. And he said to them, you know what? If you see those things, you don't have anything to worry about. You're good. And I think it's interesting that he makes a little side note in there that says, if Christ is evident in your life, then we've done our job, meaning I, I'm a real apostle. I, I, I have this apostolic authority. Paul's plea to the Corinthians was to test themselves, to see if their faith was genuine. You know what? That's probably pretty good advice for us to take every now and then too, isn't it? To test and see if there's evidence of Christ living in us. Can anybody else see that we've experienced grace in our lives because of how we live and how we talk? Have we turned away from those things that we know that we shouldn't do because Christ says it's not the best, in our best interest to do those things? Is there tangible evidence that the Holy Spirit is leading us and we're not leading it? From time to time, I think we just need to take that test. And if when the test is given, okay, we, we give it to ourselves. If, if we take that test and we can say, yeah, you know what? I, I'm loving my neighbor. I'm serving others. I'm being patient. I have joy. I have these things present in my life. Maybe not all of the time, but I'm living by grace. Then you know what? We're going to pass that test. And our faith is going to be genuine. But if when we look at those things and we, they're not evident, and if we were to ask somebody else, do you see Christ in me? And they say, no. <laughs> then you know what? There's some fear and trepidation that might come into play. In Paul's case, he didn't want there to be any fear because he was coming. So not only does he plead with them, he prays for them. So let's look at this third part of today's outline where it says, where we're looking at the prayer that Paul offers for them. I don't know about you, but there are times when I hear people say, oh, you know, you've got my prayers and whatever, that I wonder if they've ever mentioned that to God. Because prayer becomes a flippant word sometimes. We just say it because it sounds good. But I don't get the idea that Paul ever did that. Because look at what he prayed for beginning in verse 7. He says, we pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come. Even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. Well, we can't oppose the truth, but we always stand for the truth. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. Huh. I think Paul's hope could be summarized for the church in Corinthians would be that they would repent 
get right with God, do whatever they needed to do before he arrived. And he really didn't care if it made him look weak, if he didn't have to be the bad guy, the authoritarian, the one who was administering discipline during the accountability. He was willing to be weak in other people's eyes for that. All he wanted was for them to be mature in their faith. He wanted them to grow up, to remember the message that he'd given them about Christ, and to do things right. So after exerting his authority, he brings this letter to a close with some very, very positive statements that I want us to look at this morning. Where he says, dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. Let the love of God and peace be with you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. That was before COVID. <laughs> All of God's people here send you their greetings. What a great way to end a letter <laughs> in which he had to defend himself and his ministry. He pleaded that they would financially help their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. He talked about how connected he was to them as a church in Greece. He loved these people. He really, really did. So did that third visit ever take place? And what do we know about it? Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. And in one sentence, <laughs> we hear everything we know about this third visit to the church in Corinth. We'll start in verse 1. He says, when the uproar was over, that uproar was what was happening in Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus, okay, where he was just getting obliterated, you know, just physically and his teaching, all that kind of stuff. Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them, okay, those believers from Ephesus. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. Well, there he encouraged the believers in all the towns that he passed through. Okay, here it comes. Get ready. Here's the third visit. Everything we know about it. Then he traveled down to Greece. Remember where Corinth was? Corinth was in Greece. It was the only church in Greece at the time. Then he traveled down to Greece where he stayed for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some of the Jews against his life. So he decided to return through Macedonia. So what it appears is <clears throat> that the Christians in Corinth did heed Paul's plea and God answered his prayer because they seem to have been faithful to him. Now, why do I say that? It doesn't say that in that one verse. Why am I so confident in saying that they listened to his plea and God answered their, play, their prayer? Because most people would say that Paul wrote the book of Romans during that three-month period that he was in Corinth, during that third visit. And if you know Paul's writing at all, you know that when he has something to say about another church, he'll say it to whoever he's writing to. And nowhere in the book of Romans does he talk, he does mention some people from Corinth, but he doesn't talk about any problems or divisions or any things taking place. So most scholars would say, you know what, they listened. And they responded to what he wanted them to do. You see, the Corinthians knew that they were going to be held accountable, not only by Paul, but by Jesus. I think one of the greatest lessons that we can learn from our text today, and, and really the whole book of 2 Corinthians is what? It's a reflection of what Jesus has done for us. It's exactly the same thing. Jesus told us how he wants us to live. He's communicated his message with us through written word. His presence of the Holy Spirit guides us in life. And what has he done? He's promised that there's going to come a day when he's going to come back. And what's he going to do? He's going to hold us accountable. For Paul in Corinth, it was a third visit. For Jesus, it's his second coming. That will be that time of accountability for everyone. To stand before him and to show whether or not he is living in us. I'd like to end today's message with somewhat the same way that Paul ended this letter, which is with a plea and a prayer. My plea is this, that we would examine ourselves, that we would take that test. That today, we would look in the mirror and say, is Jesus Christ in me? And then figure out 
the answer. Can other people see his love coming out of you? Can they hear you say the things that he has said that are true and accurate that, that we need to communicate to other people? Do they hear us talk about the grace that we've received from him and the forgiveness of the sin that is in our past that we no longer do? Can they see any of the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us? You know what? If there is, we've got nothing to worry about. Jesus could come back now and we'd pass the test. But there might be some of us who would look at that test question and say, oh man, I, I'm just going to do that later. I'm going to put that off. You know what? That's a cause for concern. It's also a call for grace. To say, you know what? I'm going to try, but I'm probably going to fail. Yeah, you are. But I'm going to rely on God's grace to just forgive me so I can keep going and try again. What maybe we need to, if you think about it, is a spiritual marine partner when it comes to spiritual growth. Remember the story that I told you about how in the Marines, your buddy sitting next to you on each side is responsible if you fall asleep? What if in the church, we gave responsibility to another sister or brother to have that kind of accountability relationship with us? Where we told them, you know what? I want you to be responsible for what's happening in my life, and I'm willing to be responsible for what happens in your life. What difference do you think that would make? If there's someone that we can encourage, who encourages us, someone that we enjoy the peace of Christ with each and every day of our lives, my guess is we wouldn't just pass the test, we would ace the test of, God, of Christ being in us. That's my plea. The prayer that I want to share with you, I want you to share with me. It's the very last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the very last verse of this book. And I want you to say it with me as a prayer to one another today. Say it with me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Say
He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save, forever author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory. Okay, I want you to all take your right hands, put it on your forehead, ready, and go, whoosh. Okay, 16 weeks in the book of 2 Corinthians, okay? Uh, you've survived it, congratulations, and uh, thank you for uh, comments and, and interaction. Uh, the study group that met on Sunday mornings, uh, I thank them a lot because they just really helped put together uh, some of the thoughts and some of the uh, sequences of, of how the sermons would go together and stuff like that. So I'm very appreciative uh, to them for helping me with that. And um, look forward to doing that again. Uh, we won't be doing it in the next couple of series, uh, but there'll be another one that we'll do that with as we dig through uh, a book of the Bible or a topic. And I invite you uh, to be a part of that class as well. Also, I invite you to sign up to help for the breakfast on September the 10th, okay? Um, we may have 50 people, we may have 5,000 people show up, okay? <laughs> we don't know, but we're going to be prepared, okay? Uh, Sue said that even if we have to cut the, pi the pancakes into quarters, okay, we'll do that, okay, whatever it takes. But um, no, we need some people to sign up to help in the kitchen, to help serve, to help greet, and uh, we, we're going to just really promote this, guys. So hopefully uh, those who got some of the cards in the mail uh, will be reminded and uh, will come and join us on the 10th. Also on the 11th, it's kind of going to be a welcome home day. And uh, if there's some people that you know of who haven't been at South Fork for a while and uh, you'd like for them to come and worship with you, send out a special invitation that day, okay? And uh, say welcome home, okay, uh, to South Fork, especially starting on September the 11th. Also, there's T-shirts uh, that uh, the actual T-shirt sizes and stuff will be here. Actual T-shirts that will show the sizes will be here next week. But if you want to go ahead and pre-order uh, some shirts, you can do that. They're only $12 a piece. And so I think that's a pretty good bargain. And it'll take about two weeks uh, for them to get here. Uh, so we won't have them for the first breakfast, but we'll have them for the others. Okay. Um, let me see. There are two more things that I'm supposed to mention. Um, one is this was pool party week. Okay. Uh, we had a great turnout Wednesday night at the Carl's house. Uh, thank you for hosting uh, that. And uh, we had our infant and toddler uh, pool party at the Martindale house yesterday. And it was fun, okay? Uh, not as largely attended as the small group gathering, uh, but it was great uh, to see those little guys connecting and just making some good friends uh, that hopefully will carry through for a long time. So uh, there's one more thing, isn't there, that I'm supposed to talk about? I think so, I think so too. Um, most of the time, my sister Denise is up here, and uh, she will sing happy birthday to people uh, who are having a birthday. Well, tomorrow, just so happens, she has a significant birthday. Not quite 100 yet, but close. Um, and so we'd like for you to stand, and uh, everybody turn around and look at Denise. And they're going to sing happy birthday. Have a great week. Happy birthday to you. Dear Denise, happy birthday to you. Woo 
And we've got one more song up here. Oh, we do? Yes. <laughs> I forgot about that one. <laughs> Listen. Thank you for being here this morning. Have a great week.